Welcome to the Stronger Than Steel podcast with your host, Austin Davidson and John Keir, talking Steelers all the time. Now, here's Austin and John. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Stronger Than Steel podcast. It's season four, episode 31, and joining me, as always, is my co-host, John Keir. What's going on, everybody? I uh, wish we could be talking about a, a W today, but unfortunately the Steelers did lose to the 49ers 24-20 to 20 in a uh, surprisingly bad fashion. The Steelers were able to obviously force five turnovers in this game, and they still managed to lose based off of points off of turnovers, only being six on those five turnovers. But before we get into the rest of the game, uh, there's a bunch of Steelers news to go over. Uh, firstly, Ben Roethlisberger finally underwent his surgery on his injured right elbow. Uh, this was on Monday, and according to Adam Schefter, he's expected to make a full recovery in time for the start of the 2020 NFL season. They even think he's going to be throwing by April, so that's a pretty solid sign. Uh, then after that, the big news came tonight, and tonight is Monday for us as we're recording this. Uh, the Steelers have traded a fifth-round pick, which is rumored to be the Jaguars' 2025th round pick, uh, not the Steelers, uh, to the Seattle Seahawks for tight end Nick Vanette. Uh, the move comes after the injury to Vance McDonald, which we now know is a shoulder sprain. He is expected to be out about a week or so, a little, maybe even a little bit longer than that. Uh, but uh, this was for death purposes, and Vanette's hung around with the Seahawks for a while. We didn't see much of him in Week 2. He caught, caught one pass, which was a pretty key pass. It was 3rd down and 10 for the Seahawks, and he caught a 13-yard down, uh, 13 yard, uh, pass against the Steelers in Week 2. So uh, he's been pretty solid. Uh, he's played for the Seahawks for three season and seasons, and he has 29 catches for 269 yards and three touchdowns just in last season alone, uh, plus four catches for 38 yards so far this season, with obviously that one of them being the one for 13 against the Steelers. So uh, do you have anything to say about this trade? Uh, it's just obvious that the Steelers made the move with the anticipation of McDonald not being available for a little while, and it's just, uh, I don't know. I don't know that I'm mad about it per se. It's just kind of frustrating because again we talked all offseason about the problems at tight end and the lack of depth and it just it feels like something should have been done sooner if that makes sense like it shouldn't have taken something like this for this to happen i understand that yeah it should have they should have had a better tight end than uh zach gentry or even a better tight end than xavier grimble in there to be the number two or number three role uh, depending on how you looked at it but yeah honestly the, the only thing that i really don't like about this Besides losing the pick, is the fact that this guy's uh, his contract's expiring at the end of the year, so there's no guarantee he comes back. So I mean, I guess it's a low round flyer, but I would have liked to have had at least two years of control over a guy like this. Yeah, it's just a rental. I'm still kind of hope uh, because this happened so recently. I'm still holding out hope that maybe the Steelers got back like a 2021 20, seventh. I don't think that's likely at the time, but I mean, granted, for like three hours after the Minka Fitzpatrick trade. Uh, it just seemed like the Steelers had traded a first-round pick for Minka Fitzpatrick, and then it broke that, oh, yeah, there's more picks involved in that trade. So uh, I am holding out hope that maybe the Steelers got back a 2021 seven, 2021 six, something like that, something uh, just small, because it, it doesn't seem like the pick is equal to the player at the moment. I mean, it's it's a position of need for the Steelers. So it, no matter what, it's a pretty solid trade since the Steelers really did need a tight end. But... For a fifth-round pick, it probably wasn't that great, especially when you have Luke Wilson still a free agent, but obviously he's probably a free agent for a reason. But regardless, that's not the only tight end news that we have. The Steelers have signed rookie tight end Alize Mack to the practice squad. Uh, he's the Saints, He was the Saints' seventh-round pick this year and was recently cut by the team. Uh, in the corresponding move, Robert Spillane was cut, and this now means that finally... Uh, that there is a player on the team that I looked at for this year's pre-draft process. Every single prospect that I looked at did not end up as a Steeler. All all the prospects that we looked at were John's prospects. But this is one of the first ones that I actually looked at this year, and I did like Alize Mack. I did not like him as much as Drew Sample because I thought Drew Sample was going to be a sleeper guy. Obviously, Sample ended up with the um with the Bengals. But what I did like about Mac was that I thought he was in a bad offense with Notre Dame, and I thought that he had a lot more potential than he showed there because of their terrible offense and bad quarterback situation. And just to give a reminder, he did have some off the field issues. He was uh, he didn't play a whole year due to I, f- I actually forget exactly what what was the issue, but it, there was something character character 
something wrong with him, like, off the field. That's all I'm trying to say. But, uh, yeah, I think he's a solid guy. I was He was a guy that I thought the Steelers, I wanted the Steelers to get uh, after round four, but obviously they got Zach Gentry instead. So, But I'm happy with this for now. What I'm not happy with is that uh, the, the corresponding move was to cut Robert Spillane. And it's not that I was exactly in love with Robert Spillane. It's just now I don't understand the point at the moment. It's not clear to me what's happening at the moment. Because right now there's three tight ends on the practice squad and three tight end, uh, I'm, uh, assumingly three tight ends on the active roster. Because now you have on the active roster, you have Vance McDonald, Xavier Grimble, and I'm assuming, it might be four. I, I guess I shouldn't ca- say that Zach Gentry is going to be cut. Uh, you have Nick Vanette and you have Zach Gentry. And now you have three on the practice squad and you have Kevin Rader, Christian Scotland Williamson, and now Alize Mack. That seems like a lot of tight ends, a lot of not good tight ends at that as well. And I was really mad because I, I even said it. I texted John earlier today when uh, that happened. I was like, uh, I, I swear to God, if, if I see anyone cut besides Kevin Rader, uh, I'm going to be pissed. And I, I saw I saw that with Robert Splane, and I was like, what is going on here? Uh, do you have anything to say about this move? It's kind of a small move. I uh, just... You know, question for you, if you remember much about your pre-draft analysis of him, was like, what what did he do really well, and uh, what is his upside, in your opinion? I thought he was a pretty good pass catcher. I thought that that's where he he his tape didn't show. I didn't think he was the best uh, in the blocking department for, for run blocking and stuff, but I did think that he could be a bigger offensive weapon than he was used at Notre Dame. He was a guy that could get down the field. I saw him make some big catches. Uh, for a tight end, uh, anyway, he could he could really move. I thought he was pretty fast for a tight end, and um, it's really all I remember. It's just I I was happy with with what uh what he showed me. I liked his pass catching abilities. I thought that he was underutilized, and I thought that made him a sleeper as well. He just wasn't my favorite sleeper. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. Uh, no further thoughts on the matter for now. All right, and one last move. This one's even smaller. And also on the practice squad, defensive back Alexander Myers, who was floated around as a guy that could have broken out in the preseason, uh, he got injured and cut earlier on, but he's returned to the team, and the corresponding move uh, has been uh, cutting cornerback Trevon Mathis from the practice squad. So Alexander Myers has been brought back, so they obviously did see something in him, and he is he's healthy now, Assuming I, I'm assuming he is anyway. But yeah, so that really wraps up the Steelers news going to the game now. I guess we're going to go into the game. Uh, obviously, like I said, the Steelers lost 24-20. And honestly, the Steelers probably should have won probably like 38-24. to But here we are. And uh, what would you like to start with here? Well, you could look at it that way. Or if you're the pessimistic uh, kind of view, you could say the Steelers should have lost by 50. <laughs> because yeah, true. a lot of those turnovers were extremely fluky. But, I mean... What more can you say about the Steelers' defense? I mean, yes, they at the end of the day, they weren't great. I mean, they did give up all, over 430 yards. Uh, I mean, we can get into kind of like the time of possession stuff, but, I mean, the game starts off about as well as it could have if you're the Steelers. So you got a pass that's deflected and intercepted by T.J. Watt, and you get the ball right at the San Francisco 33-yard line to start for Mason Rudolph. And right then and there... I think we see a, a, a game plan from Randy Feetner that is just way too conservative. It's like 2004 all over again, and it's just you know really short, conservative passes and running plays that just really aren't amounting to anything because the 49ers aren't respecting it. No shots taken to the end zone, which I was shocked to not see that, and the Steelers settle for, settle for a field goal. And you know, the defense continues to hold, and then you get another... Uh, turnover, this one intercepted by Mika Fitzpatrick. Of really, is, I didn't think he was great because he did miss a couple tackles later in the game, but he made his presence felt immediately, and it was really nice to see that. Uh, and then again, the Steelers get a turnover, and they start with the ball on the 49ers' 24-yard line. They get a first down, and they have to settle for another field goal. I just, I really felt like the offensive game plan, especially in the first half, was just not good enough and they turned it loose more in the second half but they weren't great at that point and it just it was too little too late I just didn't see enough from this offense and it starts with the game plan I just I really didn't think that this conservative 
clammy type of game is what you needed, especially in this situation. I know you want to protect the quarterback, but there's nothing left to protect now. You've got to win. Yeah, the announcers were even harping on them. It's like, why is it Mason Rudolph throwing down the field? Why are, Eventually, they got to throw down the field and make them respect it a little bit, but they just weren't letting Mason Rudolph unload. Like, I'm pretty sure you sent me this on Twitter, the stat line, but the Steelers only finished with two passing plays that were caught after the one-yard line. Like, I'm sorry, like one yard down the field. Like, that's terrible. Like, they didn't let drive down the field at all. And granted, you could blame it on maybe wide receivers not getting open. You could bl- blame it on uh, Mason Rudolph being under pressure so much. You could blame it on a bunch of things. But that's at the end of the day, that's just ridiculous and terrible. The game plan wasn't wasn't good coming into this game. And Fickner really, really messed this game up, I believe, uh, in a bunch of ways. It's Actually, it was really bad. It was really bad planning for this game because at, at the end of the day, when you get five turnovers, I'm sorry, just to start off with this, this is the first time a team with five turnovers uh, in a game has lost since the 2016 Chargers. Like That's absolutely terrible. And in the second half, Teams that had a, a plus four turnover differential were 45, 0, and 1. The Steelers are now the one loss. It's 45, 1, and 1 because the Steelers are the one loss to have because uh, they had a plus four margin in uh, at some point in the second half. It went away because uh, of a turnover. But uh, regardless, the Steelers, this is a historically bad loss for the Steelers. This is the only loss of its kind uh, from that stat line. Like it's absol- This was absolutely terrible. Yeah, and I mean, it starts with Randy Feetner, but uh, honestly, I mean, as we've said all year, it really applies to everybody. I mean, Mason Rudolph didn't look great early on. I I honestly thought his play picked up in the second half. I thought he was better. I just didn't think he was great. And the issue is, when you've got a guy that's just okay, you really need everyone else to step up, and no one else was, I mean... Juju Smith-Schuster had the great play, but outside of that one great play, what did he do? Deontay Johnson had a couple nice plays, the long touchdown where he was wide open and the nice play where he eluded uh, Richard Sherman for a first down. But besides that, uh, James Conner didn't look very good. Jalen Samuels didn't even get a touch. Uh, Vance McDonald left the game injured. And the offensive line, surprisingly enough, got pushed around a lot in this game. And it's just the way the 49ers defense played was so aggressive and they didn't. It's like when the Steelers played the Broncos in the playoffs back in the day when Tim Tebow was the quarterback. The Steelers had nine man boxes for a lot of that game. They got burned over the top because they didn't respect Tim Tebow's ability to throw the ball. And that's something that we've seen in the limited time with Mason Rudolph, a quarterback, is that he's not as willing to push the ball down the field as anyone else. Remember the four quarterbacks Rudolph, Roethlisberger, uh, Dobbs, and <clears throat> Devlin Hodges. Of those four quarterbacks, Mason Rudolph pushed the ball down the field the least. He had the few, uh, fewest yards per attempt in training camp. So he's already not as likely to test it deep. And if you're handcuffing him early on, it's a problem. And defenses are keying in on this. So, you know, what is the adjustment here? You've got to be able to start making more aggressive pushes down the field. And we just haven't seen enough of that. And it's hurt this offense because now we can kind of just get into, I mean, Actually, first, why don't you just touch on the offensive line and the skilled players and just the poor plays first, and then we can get into the whole time possession, third down stuff. Yeah, it was really unfortunate. Karma, I had to eat my own words. We had a lengthy, uh, not a lengthy discussion, but we talked about on the podcast last time how I wasn't scared about any defensive line uh, against the Steelers' offensive line, and I had to eat those words very, very hard in this game. Alejandro Villanueva probably had the worst game of his career. Uh the whole left side of the line really was not that good. I mean, not that the whole line wasn't very good, if I'm being honest, but I just thought that the left left side was uh, worse than the right side if we're going to compare them. So that wasn't helping uh, as he was literally under pressure every like other play, it felt like. It felt like the pocket was collapsing. There was no pocket. It was just really, really terrible play from an offensive line of this pedigree. It was... I, I was I was not happy. It, when your players like that are underperforming, it's just you you know it's a bad game because so the, you don't even know where to apply the blame here because something that we discussed off the podcast and we'll probably get into now getting into the next set of skill players. James Conner hasn't been good. You hate to say it, but he's not been good. But now 
part of the problem is the offensive line uh, was really bad in this game. But not only that, the defense isn't respecting R- Rudolph's uh, passing game. So what that means is the defense is loading the box with eight players. And uh, every single James Conner rush that he had in this game was against seven or eight players. Every single one. Uh, it, there was not one where it was good. And he didn't. Ha- he should still be able to br- uh, break off a good run. I know he's not Saquon Barkley. I know he's not like Ezekiel Elliott, and he's expected to just uh, do all this stuff. But you still want to see more than one. He had one 10 yard run, which was actually pretty solid because it should have been nothing. But he turned around and was able to get the first down. It was late. It was in the second half. But he's still not been good, and that fumble was was really bad. He's it's it's been a problem that's haunted James Conner since he's been with the Steelers. Really, he's got a pretty solid fumbling problem, and it really hurt the Steelers here. The Steelers looked like they could have controlled the game with in the fourth quarter with, I believe, five minutes to go after their uh, the turnover that they had just forced on. Uh, the Steelers had just forced on defense, is what I'm trying to say. And then he fumbled it right back, and it gave the 49ers enough time to drive downfield, get back the lead, and gave the Steelers a minute, uh, minute and, I believe, 26. Uh, or It was 26, I think. Holton ran it out, and it got down to 21. But... Regardless, and then they ended up losing because they couldn't score on that drive and they needed a touchdown. So, uh, th- so there's James Conner. Now you have James Washington, who's only got I think he had four targets in this and he had one catch. No, he had two catches. Two catches for 14 yards. I'm sorry. Two, and I'm I'm starting to really bet on him not being. Uh, he's going to be a bust. I'm start. I'm starting to think that because it's just. Him and Mason Rudolph should have been immediately clicking. I was looking for that connection to happen at any point. If Juju's being covered, James Washington should have been the guy. And with Ryan Switzer and um, Ryan Switzer and Dante Moncrief, Ryan Switzer not getting any snaps on offense and Dante Moncrief being inactive, I was expecting there to be really no one to really challenge him. Holton didn't grab that many snaps on offense, and I'm just disappointed. Two catches for 14 yards isn't it? It sh- it really isn't it. Like that that's just not enough from him. Then you have Deontay Johnson, he who got that one catch of thirty nine. It was a touchdown, of course, and that was good. Juju Smith Schuster didn't show up all game until that one seventy six yard catch. Like his stat line finished okay until you see that the long was seventy six and he had three for eighty one, which means he had two catches for five yards before that on seven targets. Granted, this is all not their fault. Again, Mason Rudolph was inaccurate for a good amount of this game until like the second half where he started to pick it up. It's just there it wasn't good. Vance McDonald got hurt. What can you really do there? Xavier Grimble, he's just not not that good. Never believed in him as a second tight end. And it's just the Steelers don't have anyone. Ryan Switzer didn't play any uh, snaps, and probably a good thing. He's not really doing much besides getting like two yard little little screens, wide receiver screens. Like it, it's not going to do anything really. But like, there's no one stepping up at the skill positions. There's absolutely no one. And when you're basically losing on all fronts here. Well, what is the good thing on offense? If your offensive line is losing, if your running back isn't good enough, if your wide receivers aren't getting open until halfway through the game, and your tight end is either hurt or is just not doing anything. Like, what? what is the offense just completely, completely failed in this game? There's no really other way to put it. Like, the, it almost failed completely. I mean, I'm not, because I'm not even going to say, Mason Rudolph, I mean, granted, had a lot. It, it's all intertwined. It's the problem. You could blame Mason Rudolph's inaccuracy and bad game on the offensive line, and that there's no run game to be established. But like, he still wasn't good. James Conner, you could blame the offensive line, and you could blame that the defense didn't respect the passing game because Mason Rudolph wasn't good enough. It's all inter- intertwined here. You know what I'm saying? So the blame just goes around. And I think Cameron Hayward put it best. You, anyone pointing a finger, you should just break the finger. That he's gonna break their your finger. Because there's just no one to point it at. Everyone sucked. Every, everyone was bad. At, at least on the offense, I'm sorry. Uh, but, yeah, so what do you have to add about the offensive line and the skill players? Well, just the, the last thing I'm thinking about with James Washington is he only got four four targets and he played 92% of the offensive snaps. Mason Rudolph said he purposely doesn't go at, go at James Washington all the time, which I do understand. But in the heat of the moment, you got to start putting your faith in this guy. Um there's no excuse for it. I mean, and like you said, it's all intertwined. Everyone was bad. Uh, there was no one that played well in this game on offense. Certainly not well enough for the win anyways, obviously. Oh, yeah. You know, um, it, it, it starts next week, though, 
know with Randy Feetner, you've got to be more aggressive, and it starts with it starts with him, and then it goes down to everybody. Mason Rudolph needs to push the ball down the field a little more and continue to improve. Uh, the offensive line needs to lick their wounds, and they need to be, come out with more physicality next week. They need to do a better job of protecting their quarterback. The running backs need to do a better job of holding on to the football and making guys miss, and the receivers have to start getting open and making plays, and it's it's the stuff we've been talking about since the Patriots game, and it's continued to rear its ugly head. No improvement has been made anywhere. And I get that you're, you've got the backup quarterback, but uh, it's time. you got to start making some changes here. Exactly. you got to uh, be able to scheme your scheme around your players. The one thing Todd Healy was good about, Todd Healy was good at getting his good players involved. And to not get Juju Smith-Schuster involved to like halfway through the second quarter, is uh, uh, the second half, I'm sorry, is just ridiculous, and then you're just not being able to use your good players. Like it's it's bad. Mm-hmm. Especially when, and again, James Conner's been banged up, and he hasn't been that great. But that means Juju Smith Schuster's been the only guy, and I get that he's getting blanketed, and it's it's tough. But you got to push it a little more. It really is on everybody. That's all there is to it. Yeah, hundred percent. And uh, just one last thing, I did want to say about Connor, just to say, like the, the how we know it's not all on the offensive line. There's a stat, right, that I think you also sent to me today. Either you sent it to me or I just saw it on Twitter. But uh, it's that out of all the running backs that have a rush, uh, the there was a percentage made of how many times they were tackled on the first contact. James Connor is in dead last. He can't break a tackle for. Anything dead last ninety two percent of the time he's bro- he's brought down on the first contact, which the best is I believe thirty seven percent with Malcolm Brown the uh, Rams, uh backup running back and then second is like Austin Eckler at fifty three point seven something like that but James Conner is in dead last at number fifty so you know it's it's bad. Yeah, he really hasn't done anything to separate himself this year. Really, ever since he suffered that injury in the Panthers game, he hasn't been the same player. Yep. Yeah, no, definitely not the same player. So hopefully that can get things turned around soon. Uh, again, it's, it's a collective effort here. They all have to continue to get better. And, uh, you yeah, know, there's no time better than right now to turn it loose because there's nothing to save it for anymore. Yep. Yep. And then on the defensive side, look, they, they did a good job today. And I guess I guess this is the, the last thing I guess to get into with the offense is the drive sustainability. They have, I think, only four drives that this whole season that have lasted longer than 40 or four minutes. Uh, the offensive snap count, they had 53 offensive snaps in this game. I think they had like 60-something in the Patriots game, but that probably had a lot to do with garbage time stuff. And they had, I think, 57 or something uh, last week against the Seahawks. Meanwhile, their defense played 79, 79 snaps. And, I mean, look at these guys who played 100% of the snaps. Both inside linebackers, Mark Barron and Devin Bush, played 100%. Maybe that's why we saw Barron taking a playoff. Dude was probably gassed. He played 79 snaps in this game. Joe Hayden played 78 Terrell Edmonds and Minka Fitzpatrick played all uh, 79 snaps. I mean, these guys, Steven Nelson played 100% of the snaps. Bud Dupree and TJ Watt played 75 and 72. That's 95 and 91% respectively. These guys are gassed, man. Uh, We've seen it in all three games so far, and it continued to rear its ugly head. Why are the Steelers not... Why do they just not feel like playing? Maybe Mike Hilton got hurt. He played just 17 snaps. Why is Cameron Sutton playing just 11? Why is Ola Adani playing 11 snaps? Who knows? I guess they don't trust in their backups at all here. Because, I mean, we've been waiting for Ola Adani to break out. And Ola Adani had a quarterback pressure in this game. Uh, I forget exactly what. It should have been a sack. Or him and... Oh, see, now my memory is not doing good. I remember seeing the 92 coming off the left side and someone else coming off the left side, and it was the other guy, the other Steelers player that came off the left side that should have had the sack on Jimmy Garoppolo on that play, but it didn't happen, and uh, Garoppolo ended up rolling out to the left, and I forget exactly what even happened on that play, but regardless, they just don't trust in their backups, and here we have the defense playing 58.7% of the snaps in the entire game. That shouldn't be happening. The offense should be in control of this game and should be 
uh, the one playing more of the snaps here. And like you said, they're all gas. Like, they're all playing 100% of the snap. Not all of them. Obviously, you just listed it out. But it's just they're playing a lot of snaps in these games, and these guys are tiring out. And it's just they're not meant to play 100% of the snaps. Mark Barron wasn't brought in to play 100% of the snaps. He was supposed to be a rotation piece. But due to, the, uh, due to Vince Williams being hurt and the depth behind it just being questionable because you don't want to start Tyler Matakavich, Mark Barron's forced into this situation to have to play 100% of the snaps. I was never expecting Mark Barron to be a starter here, and not for the long run, after Devin Bush was brought in, of course, I mean. But, like, here we are, and this is the situation we're in, and the offense isn't helping them at all, and now you have a team that doesn't even believe in the guys that it's developing I have no I I don't get it. Every every single time I've seen Ola Dani on the field, he does something good. Whether he's forced to pressure, he's he's doing something. I, I just I don't understand why he doesn't get to play more snaps just to see what he's doing. Because here's something that I will say bad about the defense, and it was exactly why I didn't get my hopes up. Bud Dupree cannot turn speed into power. And this is the problem that when he gets to go up against backup, uh, a backup offensive tackles, it doesn't matter because it's still a big dude. It's still an offensive tackle, and Bud Dupree is not going to be able to do anything against a guy that's big because he cannot turn his speed into power, and that's been a big problem. And it's just you didn't see it in this game, even when Sk- uh, Skull was getting sorry Skull, it's School. Even after School was getting all those penalties in the second half. None, every, you could, everyone could go back and watch. None of those were, uh, forced by Bud Dupree. Every single one was forced by someone else playing on the, uh, playing further out than Bud Dupree that came in as a rusher. So the one was on Cameron Hayward. The other one, I, the other two, I can't remember what they were on, but regardless, uh, it's just Bud Dupree isn't that good as a pass rusher. And they probably really should have used more Ola Adani in this game to try attacking it. Cause Ola Adani at least seems to have a little bit more moves and stuff other than being able to get there in stunts and and just speed alone. So I, it's the it's the one thing that I, I'm really mad about on the defense. It's just Bud Dupree is not that good at, at rushing the passer. It's nothing new, something we don't know. It's always been the same thing. He can't turn speed into power. He can't turn speed into power. He can't turn speed into power, and it's never changed. It's just this is who he is, and it's just... They should be playing these backups more, and that's that, that's really it. Like the guys that are playing well, Cameron Sutton, I should say, has also played out uh, really, really good. Like every time he's come in, he's made really good tackles. He's played really good defense. He should be getting some more snaps as well. Like how are you going to do that? And Mike Hilton only getting seventeen snaps is absolute is is madness. It, it's it's absolute madness, man. I I have no idea what happened there. It must be. I'm having to think. I'm thinking that it must be personnel based because we saw a lot of Kyle Hughes checks. We saw a lot of a lot of double tight end sets. I think the Steelers. I don't think the Steelers played dime in this game, so it might have had to do something with that. Maybe that's why you saw a little less of him. But I am questioning their personnel usage quite a lot, to be honest with you. If you don't trust Ola Dany, when are you ever going to trust him? Uh, the time is now. This is uh, you're about as desperate as you can be. Uh, something needs to change, and to one other thing I didn't like about the defense was they gave up too many longer runs early in the game. Now, late in the game, when they were gassed, I kind of knew it, that they were just going to get the ball smothered down their throat, and that's what happened. I mean, that's, that's going to happen when you've been on the field as much as you have, especially when the Niners run that up-tempo style. You, just, you knew it was going to happen. But early on, they need to do a better job of stopping the run. Uh, I, just, I didn't feel like there was a whole lot going on. I mean, in terms of run defense, Matt Breida's first three carries went for five, four, and eight yards. I'm um, just I'm looking right here now. He had trying to see. Breida had a really good game. I, honestly, the whole ground game was really good. But early on, the the Niners were getting too many chunk plays, and I think it really came back to bite the Steelers in the end. But I can't blame them as much for the end would have liked to see them get a stop after that long touchdown to Juju, but the Steelers' offense just hasn't helped them, because even when they score points in this game, none of them came on long drives. So, seriously, they had 12 offensive drives off. Are you ready to hear like the length of the amount of plays of all of them? Sure. 
I'll, I'll exclude their two longest drives. But first, we have a four-play drive that ended in a field goal, four plays that ended in a punt, four plays interception, four plays turnover on downs, three, uh, three plays punt, three plays punt, three plays punt, three plays touchdown that took 131 off the clock, three plays punt, three plays fumble, four plays, or sorry, two plays touchdown. So your two touchdown drives were three plays and two plays. And your uh, longest uh, two drives were a six-play drive that ended in a field goal that came off of a turnover. And you had an 11-play drive that went 34 yards and resulted in a punt. So of your four drives that have all season that have gone, you know, uh, you have four drives this year that have been four minutes or longer. One of them happened in this game, and it, it was a punt. So I really don't think there's much more to say about that other than the Steelers are, again, struggling on third down. They're in manageable third down situations. But in this game, again, they were three for 12. They've converted three third downs in every game so far. Yeah, and that's terrible. Like, the, the third down percentage is what's what's really, really bad about this team because I, I love Twitter for my sports stuff. Uh, another thing I saw on Twitter, so the Steelers are one of the worst teams at converting third downs this year. But what they're not is the worst team at being in a, a not manageable third down situation. In terms of average yards to go on third down, they rank 13th in the league, like like 13th, uh, number one being not that bad. So this team is putting themselves in manageable positions and they're just not converting. Like That's just like salt in the wound. Like They're not good there, and they're just really, really struggling. So I just, I don't even know what to say. It's just, the defense could have been better, yes. But, I mean, they came up with the five turnovers, and, yeah, you can say they were, you know, gimmicky, stupid mistakes by the offense. But, I mean, I'll take it, right? Like, you'll take that. It's just, it's tough. Like, yeah, they could have been better, but it's hard to place a ton of, pin a ton on them when the offense's two touchdown drives came on really quick. Like, they both combined took – uh, less than two and a half minutes, those two touchdown drives combined. So, I mean, even with the successful drives, this defense was still getting gassed. Yep. Yeah, because there was just no time being taken off the clock, no time for them to sit and rest. And so, like, going back to those guys that are getting all those snaps and on defense, like, it's rough for them. That's a lot of playing time. And at the end of the game, the Steelers still had a chance, but they went, uh, they went three and out. Uh, I just this was just one of those ugly games, and I guess where do we go from here? I don't know, man. I finished last podcast saying that uh, I was probably gonna predict a win for the next week, and now I don't. I don't know. I and uh, I expected this team to go eight and eight. I don't know if I could predict this team to go get five wins at the, at the moment. It's just if you can't win with five turnovers and you have six. Points off a turn off of those five turnovers. Where are you ever going to win? Where are you ever going to be put able to put up more than twenty points a game? And what team isn't going to be able to outscore you at that point if they could get five turnovers and still outscore you? Like it, it's just that this team really should at the moment shouldn't win more than three games. Which I'm sure I'm hoping this next game, uh, Randy figures it out and the rest of the team figures it out here, but. I don't know, man. It's getting worse and worse by the day of the week, it feels. Yeah, there's just not enough improvement. In fact, I'd say on the offensive side, there was regression. You know, we talked about Keith Butler being on watch. Really, I I talked about how I was going to take a shot every time I saw a linebacker on a receiver. I didn't see that once in this game. Yeah, Keith, Keith Butler actually did okay in this game at, at some points. And honestly... Something that's been floating around is Danny Smith looks great right now. Danny Smith, we were ready to sack after last season, and Danny Smith seems like the only guy that's okay. Like the both Tyler Matakevich and Jordan Dangerfield are tied for fourth in the uh, NFL with special teams tackles. You have Chris Boswell, who's perfect. Jordan Berry, I could even say, is probably having a career year right now, which is in- it, amazing for Jordan Barry. Granted, he's being put in situations where he can punt from all the way from his uh, the Steelers' side of the field, so he's able to punt more. But 
all all his guys are perform, for, performing great. So seems like Danny Smith right now is the only like perfect coordinator at the time uh, uh, this year. Yeah, I mean, special teams has been probably the lone bright spot for this uh, team so far. Stuff is at, stuff has to change. Simple as it is. Yep, stuff has to change. All right, so let's get into week three. It was a uh, it was a rough week for me, man. Uh, I had the Thursday night uh, game right with Jacksonville and Tennessee, but starting on Sunday, things turned bad for me in a hurry. And it starts with the Colts and Falcons. And the Colts get up early. They almost uh, the Falcons nearly come back in this one, but the Colts were able to eke out a twenty seven twenty four victory. Yeah, Jacoby Brissett had an insane game for him. He had like a 300-yard passing game, and he did really, really solid. And that's my man's, of course. So, yeah, uh, Falcons did keep it closer than I thought it would be. The Bengals went to Buffalo, and actually they the Bills were up, I think, 14 nothing in that game. Then the Bengals took the lead, and the Bills were able to retake it late in the game. But I thought the Bills looked dominant early on, but then they just kind of lost their grip on it and nearly ended up losing. This game was closer than I really thought it should have been. Yeah, the Bills... Really, I, I thought I was going to be wrong the whole way. I, it Really, the Bengals didn't start, like, doing anything until, like, halfway through the third quarter, it felt like. And then they, they were down 14-0, and then all of a sudden they took the lead. It was just out of nowhere, it felt like. But, um, yeah, um, I, I was kind of impressed with Cincy. I, I was kind of impressed with Cincy's ability to uh, bounce back and it laid in the game, but uh, they, it wasn't enough. No, it was not, and neither was the performance of anybody on the Miami Dolphins for the third straight week, and somehow what is their best game of the year, they still lose by 25. The Dallas Cowboys run roughshod over the Dolphins, whom I had bet along with a couple of buddies of mine money that uh, the Dolphins would win, and to be honest with you, it looked okay early on. They did miss a field goal, but Josh Rosen and the Dolphins were getting in the red zone. I think they had three red zone trips in the first half, and I think they got like a field goal on them. Oh, that team is so bad. Even when they get in position, they fumble it away. They throw a pick. Rosen gets strip sacked. You know, Kenyon Drake fumbles. It's just, it's rough. It is unfortunate. Yeah, being in Miami must not be fun. It could be, it gives me a little bit of feelings of being better because Pittsburgh at least is not Miami right now. And uh, they're just really bad. There's a few scares early on that Miami was hanging in there and getting in really good positions, but... Miami is really good at blo- at blowing any chance they're given, so Dallas still ended up covering here. Yeah, and it really looked like they weren't going to for a while, but they ended up blowing that one open uh, just at the end there. Yep. The, De- the Denver Broncos went to Green Bay, and I thought this one was one of the easier matchups of the week. The Packers' defense smothered the Broncos' lifeless offense, and the Broncos' defense, no sacks again. The third straight week, no sacks this season. Aaron Rodgers being kept clean and the Packers keep rolling 27-16. Something's wrong there, man. This this is the only time in NFL history a team hasn't had a sack through the first three weeks. Like, there are teams that have finished with only... I, I remember looking up last year to try and see if the Raiders were on track to be one of the worst teams ever for sacks in a year. But And, and I believe the team with the least amount of sacks had 10 throughout the entire season, but never has a team had zero through three weeks. They're probably livid seeing Shaquille Barrett. Shaquille Barrett by himself has eight sacks through three weeks. He already got an incentive from the Buccaneers for eight sacks. That it was a 250k incentive. That obviously is a former uh former Bronco, so the the Broncos are probably livid, but there's something I, I haven't really watched the Broncos game, I'll be real honest there. There's something wrong if Von Miller and, and Bradley Chubb aren't able to get a sack. Like, I know Derek Wolf went down this last game, but he's not known to be a pass rusher, really, for the most part. But, like, that's insane. I have no idea how, with a guy like Vic Fangio, a defensive-minded coach that's so good at, at what he does, how they don't have a sack. It really is quite perplexing and troubling, to say the least. They're 0-2 now. Or, sorry, 0-3. Uh, headed for what could be a tough season. The NFC North continues to look good, though. The Detroit Lions moved to 2-0-1 with a win on the road against the Eagles, who are 1-2 and and are quickly in trouble here. Yeah, uh, Philly has such a good te- team on paper. Like, I, I don't honestly understand what's happening. Like, 
I heard Ronald Darby has been terrible. I, I, I this is another team I haven't really watched. Their whole secondary, it's the whole secondary is bad. Okay, yeah. So I haven't really watched a game, but I, I, I see a lot of Eagles. The main ones I see them harp on are Nelson Algahor and and Ronald Darby. They've been the biggest two that I see Eagles fans complain about. And uh, I just I don't know, man. Like I thought I thought Algahor was trash for his first two first. Yeah, first two seasons when he was drafted. Then he kind of actually finally had a, a turnaround last year, I thought. And now I guess he's returning back to what he was with dropping balls and stuff. But regardless, I, I don't know what's happening with Philly. Maybe losing, um, oh, what's the Jets GM name? I'm not sure. Okay, well, losing that guy, he was, uh, because he came from the Eagles. I can't remember his name right now. Uh, that might have been a bigger loss than maybe anyone expected or or something. I have no idea what's going on with the with the Eagles right now. The Eagles are such a good team on paper. It doesn't quite add up. The Chiefs went in uh, went in hosting the Baltimore Ravens, and they it looked like they were going to pull away, but the Ravens came back in late thanks to a couple of crazy plays by Lamar Jackson that honestly should, should never have happened. Uh, the Chiefs either fell asleep on it or they just got the Ravens just got lucky, but they made a game out of it. And uh, because of that, Will lost out on a parlay that he bet. <laughs> and, because it, it was, uh, like, I think one point off or two points off, and he was he was pretty salty about it. And I just, I really, this was Lamar Jackson's worst game from what I understand. I, I watched the first half, and I just, I didn't feel very comfortable watching him throw the football. Yep, this was basically what I was expecting here. I thought he, I think he's an okay quarterback, and he's just not a good quarterback. And we saw him play some really garbagey teams when it comes to defense up until here. And even here, man, like, I don't, the football gods were just like, yo, we need to help Lamar Jackson too. We can't let people go back to thinking he's a running back. Like, when he, those two fourth down plays where he just heaves it up, you, did you see them? Did you? Yeah, I saw both of them. The one to Sneed and I. Uh, the, the other one to Marquise Brown. Uh, I, I forget. I, I only remember the Sneed one. I saw them both in both in time because this is like the most important one p.m. game to me to watch. I felt like I thought it was going to be a good one, but it was like Jesus himself didn't want Lamar Jackson to look bad in this one. I saw him throw up that first one, and I was like, "That's getting intercepted." There's a defender right there. And somehow it's still caught. I was like, th- this would never happen. If this was a Steelers game, that would have been pick six right there. Like, it, it's just, I have no idea what happened in the Chiefs, with the Chiefs that they weren't able to pick off those. But, like, the Chiefs were blowing out the Ravens for a good majority of this game. Like, it was incredible that Baltimore was able to get back into that. But it took a lot of luck. There was a lot of luck in this game for, for the Baltimore to even crawl back as much as they did. Indeed, but the Ravens fall to two and one, and they're still they're currently leading the division, which is crazy to say that the Steelers aren't out of reach. But uh, the Ravens might not be as legit as we thought. But we'll see. The Raiders went to Minnesota and got stomped. That's about all there is to say with that. Yep, I don't have anything to add for that game. Uh, the Jets uh, made me sad because the Patriots went out and they scored 30 straight points to start the game, and I thought that the Patriots were going to cover. And then the Jets, I think they blocked a punt or something like that, and then Jared Stidham threw a pick six, and Tom Brady came back in, and that was it. Yep. Yep, and it forced New England not to cover, which is so stupid. I was so mad. The Jets' offense did nothing, literally nothing. The Patriots, I forget his last name, it's Gunner something, he muffed the punt, and Jamal Adams recovered in, in the end zone. And then the other one was a pick six from their backup quarterback. I was so mad seeing that Patriots didn't cover here. The Daniel Jones hype train has officially left the station. I really did not see this coming. The Buccaneers got off to an early lead, but the Giants come all the way back, and Daniel Jones scores the winning touchdown in the final minute. Uh, Bruce Arians makes an interesting decision to take a delay of game penalty for his kicker, Matt Gay, who then pushes the field goal, and, uh, you know, they lose. So now he looks like an idiot for doing that. Yes, he definitely does. He said it was to help his kicker, and it obviously did not work out. But uh, Danny Dimes is out here and about the legend of 
of him starts off early. He's one of the few quarterbacks to ever come back in, uh, from an 18-point lead. At uh, uh, 18-point deficit, I'm sorry. Um, it's just... Uh, it's pretty good. I mean, also, I just want to say it one more time. Shaquille Barrett is a really bad, bad man. He's really, really good pass rusher, which is... It's crazy to me. Eight, he leads the league in sacks. Never would have expected that. I'm sure someone bet on it, though. Do you remember the old uh, commercial with Cam Newton and that little kid who was warming up his arms <laughs> saying, like, I'm going to become your mom's favorite player? <laughs> yes, because I keep seeing the memes about it, but go ahead. Yeah, because uh, who knew that was Kyle Allen? <laughs> I love that meme, dude. I love that meme so much. Yeah, it really was Kyle Allen. So who would have thought, we certainly didn't think, that the uh, that the Carolina Panthers were going to go in and lay a whooping on the Arizona Cardinals, even though the Cardinals aren't that good. Uh, apparently Cam Newton just sucks. Sorry. It, it really is. People are talking about the Panthers moving on from him after this year, and I kind of agree. Like, what? He's not, not the MVP Cam, and he hasn't been for a while. It's taken a while for people to kind of join this train. I kind of felt like I was on. I was probably on this train a little too early, but like Cam hasn't been good for a while in my eyes. And I mean, you see Kyle Allen come in and throw four touchdowns like it's nothing. It's just like whenever if Newton even comes back from his list Frank uh, injury in his foot, like is he even going to be the starter? We'll have to see. After the it, one game doesn't define a guy, especially against a team uh, like Arizona, which isn't, which literally is pretty devoid of talent for the most part. Besides Chandler Jones, which Chandler Jones did do his part in this game, but that's not enough. I got to give you credit. You saw the Saints hanging in there, and they actually won over the Seahawks. The Seahawks scored on, on the very last play. That was a deceiving score at the end there. Uh, I, I guess I really just the Seahawks maybe just aren't that good, and that makes the loss against them in Week 2 that much more painful. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if it's Seahawks being bad or the New Orleans team's team being very complete. I just still really like a uh, New Orleans team, even with, t- I, cause I, so here's the issue or not the issue. I really like Teddy Bridgewater. I liked him in Minnesota. I liked him when he went to the Jets. I have always liked Teddy Bridgewater. I always thought he was going to be the best uh, quarterback from that draft class. And I, I still like him here. Like he's not Drew Brees. Of course, he's never going to be Drew Brees. But I liked him, and I thought he was starting caliber, and I thought he was top 15 starting caliber, like the better half of the league of quarterbacks. So I didn't feel as uh, I didn't feel as bad with him starting, and I, I thought that they could tear apart uh, Seattle's defense, and what ended up happening was Alvin Kamara teared up uh, Seahawks' defense, where the Saints blew them out, essentially. The Saints had this game like locked down really early on. like The Seahawks weren't able to do much, but yeah, it still hurts. I don't know if the Seahawks are just really bad or or what here. I feel like if they get Jalen Ramsey, they're immediately way better, though. Yeah, absolutely. Time will tell. It looks like the Jaguars might be trying to hold on to him. Yeah, it seems like they're trying to make amends, which I think would be smart. Agreed. I agree. Uh, Houston Texans go into L.A., and they... The Chargers twenty seven to twenty. That Chargers team is just it's tough. They're really shorthanded right now. Yeah, they fell apart too. I, I checked the score of this game early, and it like the the Chargers had it. The, Ch- uh, the Chargers, I, I believe, when I checked the score, I might be wrong here and confusing with another game. I'm pretty sure it was like seventeen to like three, or seventeen to ten, something like that. I was like, oh well, I guess I I talked all this smack about them for no reason, and Houston just battled back <laughs> and and. Won it. I, I was kind of surprised to see that, but yeah, this Chargers team is is really injured right now. I mean, you just kind of hate to see it. It's just kind of like Keenan Allen and Austin Eckler trying to do everything on their own, and like the defense isn't helping at all. On Sunday night, the Los Angeles Rams went to Cleveland and got an ugly win over the Dog Pound. And man, uh, the Browns. The only team that looks worse than the Browns in the North might be the Bengals and Steelers, and that's saying something because. Browns really haven't looked that good either. They they really don't look good at all. If you ever feel bad about the Steelers play calling so far this year, just remember that Kitchens called a draw on fourth and nine in this game. So if if it makes you feel any better, uh, Freddie Kitchens quite literally pissed this game away. He didn't even give his team a chance. They might allow this might allow the Ravens to 
run away with the division with like a six and ten record. <laughs> Honestly, this whole division sucks. Honestly, I'm not. I mean, the Ravens could be for real, but I mean, you're thinking if the Steelers are as bad as they, if they continue to be as bad as they are, you're saying that the Ravens get basically six free wins, and then who, like that some of the teams that they beat outside are going to be Arizona and uh, and Miami. Miami. Yeah, so like. This te- the, the whatever team comes out of this division as the playoff contender is gonna be like a want first round exit uh, in my in my opinion. I mean it's early in the year, but like it's gonna. But I feel bad. <laughs> this division sucks. Yeah, it has not looked good early on, and of course injuries have played a part. But man, even in the Browns went over the Jets. Like they, it really felt like they did not do a good job in that went over the Jets. No, and they, you felt like they should have done more. Like. And it's really funny. People are really coming at Baker Mayfield's neck. He has, like, five interceptions through the first three games and only three touchdowns. And, like, so I saw Giants fans attacking him the most today. Giants fans were really going at his neck because he said he was – he's. I know he talked some smack about Daniel Jones being drafted number six, which uh, honestly is fair still. I still defend that. He would have been there at 17. But uh, regardless, anyway, that's off topic. He's real. Fans are really coming for Baker Mayfield's neck. He's been called overrated a lot through the first three weeks. Yeah, time will tell where things go, but it has not been a good start. Hasn't been a good start for the Redskins either. They fall to 0-3 and get manhandled by the Bears uh, in Washington, D.C. That team looks defeated, and I, I just don't think they are comfortable with Dwayne Haskins. They don't want to throw him into the fire. Yeah, Washington is bad, and they should feel bad. I feel bad for the guy. There's a guy over the weekend who put an 86 cent bet uh, that was parlayed with like 20 and uh, 20 NFL and college games. And if the if the Redskins won this game, he would have won five million. Yeah, five hundred thousand dollars. Five hundred thousand dollars after like 19 other things had went right for him in the day. I if I was that guy, I would have been so bad. But to be fair, this Redskins team is. So bad. So I mean, I, I I saw it coming, but he made a lot of I I forget what exactly what he did. He made a lot of bold choices. You hate to see that happen. You do. You really do. And then the last game, of course, the Steelers did not cover, or they did cover a six and a half point spread, but obviously it came up short in the victory. Yeah, I I did say the Steelers were going to win, so I did get the uh, right call there. But I mean, you hate to see it. So Austin, you went ten and six this week, another stellar week, and I dropped back down to five and eleven. So you're twenty six and twenty two, and I'm seventeen and thirty one. So I'm about uh, I'm nine games behind you. So not a great year for me so far, but I still have hope for now. Yeah, for now. I don't know how you got worse when things got easier. <laughs> I I was do- I was doing bad when we had three choices. This now we're down to two. You should be doing better. Um, I'm. I'm feeling bold about my sleepers. Like I think I'm, I think I'm cool picking the Redskins because I'm like, ah, oh, that's uh, that's a nifty pick. No one's gonna bet that, and then you know it blows up in my face, and I'm like, why did I pick the Redskins? <laughs> that's fair. You know that's fair. So here I am. So all right. Hopefully the last time we talk about Antonio Brown on this podcast for a good while, he after being cut by the Patriots, he went on a Twitter tirade the other day and. Went after Ben Roethlisberger, went after Robert Kraft, and said he's done in the NFL. And yesterday uh, posted a picture on Instagram that he is going to be enrolling or that he has enrolled at Central Michigan, his alma mater, for some classes while all this stuff is going on. So apparently teams were interested, but no one's going to sign him while this whole legal process is going on. So good riddance, I guess. I just, I don't know. I, I run out of things to say with this guy. I just can't imagine being a professor and trying to read an Antonio Brown essay. Like, can you can you imagine that? <laughs> What's gonna happen when uh, a professor says something that he doesn't agree with? He's gonna call him a cracker and then <laughs> and leave. <laughs> or, or he's gonna call him an Uncle Tom. <laughs> <laughs> that too. Uh, I, just, I mean, I guess. I guess the one thing I'll say is, like, of everything he could have done, I guess, like, this is probably the best PR move for him, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, going back to school, doing something. Either that or getting therapy. That's, like, the only good things he could have done. 
Yeah, but he's never going to admit he he's done anything wrong or said anything wrong. No, of course not. Nope. Of course not. And then last but not least, safety, or sorry, not last, but uh, Atlanta Falcons safety Keanu Neal, another tough blow for him. He suffered what seems to be a season-ending Achilles injury. You might remember last year he tore his ACL on opening night on Thursday night football and missed the entire season. Uh, you hate to see it for a guy whose rookie contract is about to expire, so he's probably going to miss out on a big day, payday because of it. Yeah, he's a really good safety, too. Uh, it really does suck for him. Now he's going to be missed basically two years in a row. And, I mean, I I hope it... In recent years, we haven't seen injuries affect contracts like like uh, in the past, but I feel like two back-to-back is pretty rough. So I'm still hoping for a big payday for... Ken O'Neal. I think he deserves it. I think that a team should bet on him because uh, he is a really good player. I agree with you. And uh, last but not least here, we've got Thursday Night Football. Uh, of course, we'll do our prediction here. So the uh, Eagles are playing in Green Bay at Lambeau Field on Thursday night. The Packers are four and a half point favorites. How are you feeling about this game? Um, I think I'm done picking with the Eagles until they show me anything. Like, the Eagles have been really underperforming, and the Packers have honestly sort of impressed me. I didn't really think that their defense was going to be legit. Even after week one, I was like, let me let me see if they could really uh, succeed against other guys. And the Packers, I think, have done a pretty good job. So I'm going to pick the Packers to cover here. I think that the Eagles are just not what they should be. And, I mean, they lost Ronald Darby now, so their secondary is even more uh, banged up, at least for a few more weeks. Not that, like I said, Eagles fans said he was playing terribly anyway, so maybe it's a help that he's gone. But uh, regardless, it's just I don't have faith in the Eagles at the moment anymore. So I'm picking the Packers to cover. How about you? Yeah, I am as well. The you know the Packers' defense has just been so good, and the Eagles' offense is struggling Looks like they're going to be without Deshaun Jackson again, and you've got the Aguilar issues there. Carson Wentz playing too much hero ball. Zach Ertz getting blanketed. It's just it hasn't been a good look for them. Uh, Carson Wentz has been taking some shots too. And then on the other side, the Packers with their defense doing so well, their offense all has to do is be solid. And with the suspect secondary and Aaron Rodgers, even if it's not the Aaron Rodgers we're used to seeing in terms of his prime. I still have a hard time thinking the Packers won't win this one by at least a touchdown. Yeah, me too. But I think that basically wraps it up. There's just one last thing I wanted to say is that uh, on the last podcast, we did say that uh, we we did know that an interception was happening in this game. We somehow still messed it up with, between picking six players. Obviously, we uh, bet we didn't bet. We just kind of we kind of just talked about it. We who we thought we'd get the first interception. And uh, neither of us picked T.J. Watt to get the first interception of the year for the Steelers. So I think I, that's fair, though. Yeah, I, th- I think it's fair. I mean, he had he didn't have an interception all last year. He had one. Yeah, he he's had one interception that came in his first NFL game. Exactly. Like <laughs> it was hard to bet on. It was probably not going to be on there. But oh, oh, one last thing. Remember, you had asked previously who was going to have more snaps. Was it wasn't it like a Danny and Gilbert combined special teams and uh, defense? Oh, yeah, yeah, I did. Okay, so Adani, I, I forget exact totals on uh, defense and special teams, but Adani played 27, I believe. It was 11 defensive and 16 special teams, and Gilbert played 23 special teams, zero on defense. So 27 to 23, a slight edge for Adani. Oh, wow. I honestly forget who I picked. I, I, I don't even remember because I remember it being like close to my head because like, I feel like Ulysses Gilbert is going to outsnap him on special teams. But like, and he did. He did. Yeah, yeah, he did. It's just I didn't know if it was gonna be because I, I, I didn't know how much the team was gonna use a lot Danny on defense. But interesting, interesting to note. Yep. But uh, yeah. So I guess that pretty much wraps it up. So everybody, you've been listening to season four, episode thirty one of the Struggling and Seal podcast. If you want to leave us an email, you want to shoot us a message on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, or even check out our website. They'll all be in the description below. Uh. Any, leave us anything. We love to hear feedback. And then, uh, yeah, so I guess everybody, have a good night. On to Cincinnati. Yes, sir. You have been listening to Stronger Than Steel Podcast. Thank you for joining us today. And don't forget to check out our website listed in the description below.